Books make you hope. Books make you dream. Books make you laugh. Books make you scream. This is the Books That Make You Show. Discussing books with authors and experts, unraveling the inner pages of all the books that help make us who we are. Hosted by Desiree Duffy. Welcome, one and all. It is the Books That Make You Show, and I'm your host, Desiree Duffy. And today, we're talking about books that make you want to be a superhero. Now, we sure do love our superheroes, don't we? Uh, Whether you're a fan of the Marvel Universe or you're on the side of DC or you're a member of one of the many, many fandoms that are out there, chances are the idea of having superpowers and doing good in the world, thwarting evil, has a certain appeal to it, doesn't it? Today, we are talking to someone who has explored them all and contributed to numerous anthologies about topics such as Wonder Woman, Star Trek, Batman, Game of Thrones, and Black Panther, and so many, many more. Uh, Jenna Bush is not, by the way, she's not the former first daughter. Jenna Bush is here with us today. She is the founder and editor-in-chief of Legion of Leia, which is a part of Vital Thrills. She has hosted and written for sites like Deep Breath, Sci-Fi, Fangirls, Nerdist, ComingSoon.net, Metro, Birth, Movies, Death, IGN, AOL, The Washington Post, The Huffington Post, and many, many more. She also used to host Cocktails with Stan Lee, with the legendary Stan Lee. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Right now, my friend, Jenna Bush, who has also helped out so much with different books that make you events, and with the LA Book Fest, you've moderated panels. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. This is so much fun because it's like you are, I I feel a little bit like the pressure is on because you have hosted. (laughs) I'm very scary. (laughs) You you are. You're terrifying me right now. But you've been doing this for so many years. So I'm just a little bit in awe because you have worked with some of the greats. You've done lots of interviews with people. You've done a lot of cons, a lot of conventions. So you you know this world so well. So um, I I just let's let's start with the big topic, because I do feel like superheroes are something that we gravitate to. And especially now, it feels like with everything going on, we really need our heroes now more than ever. Why, Why do you feel that people have this affinity for superheroes? I think superheroes show the best in us. Um and the way that supervillains show the worst in us. I think that particularly right now, we're all desperate for something to come and swoop in and save us all. Um, and I think that the focus is sort of almost shifting away from just superheroes and into being a superhero in real life. Um, and, you know, we're looking at our nurses and doctors as superheroes, people who are, you know, working at grocery stores, uh, people who are essential workers, they're superheroes. Um, and I think aside from the fact that we love them, we love the costumes, we love their, their morals. We love the idea of wanting to help people, but do it in a way that doesn't hurt other people. But I think we're also starting to recognize that a lot of us are superheroes and that even in a small way, we can do small things to help other people and be real superheroes. Oh, that's fantastic. I I agree. I mean, between social distancing and COVID and just things that are going on in the world, it just feels like wanting somebody to swoop in and save us is necessary. And even if we go back to the 50s and 60s, when Superman and some of these superheroes that we still love today were just starting out, a lot of that even then seemed like it was in response to the threat of the Cold War and the the enemy and technology, science, and, you know, we were going to the moon. What did that hold for us? Do you feel like that's part of it, too, that the the, the things that are going on in the world and technology and everything moving really fast kind of brings us back to that again? I definitely think so. I think um, one of the things about superheroes is that just like any sci-fi, really, we can examine things in a way that feel too uncomfortable if we look at them in real life. So we can mm-hmm. examine gender politics and we can examine war and we can examine what's right and what's wrong. Um, but we, if we do it with a superhero, 
there, it, it removes it one step from us. So we can talk about things in a very different way. So, you know, if you look at something like say Star Trek, not that, you know, they're superheroes, but you know, lots of superheroes don't have powers. So, you know, Tony Stark or Batman, um, they have lots of money, which is super great. But, <laughs> but, but if you think about it, like we're, we, we just, we need this right now. We need to feel empowered. And we did during World War II and we did during the Cold War. And anytime there's unrest in some way, it gets addressed in comics. It gets addressed in sci-fi. And I think, I think that's really important because, you know, sometimes it's too fraught to say, sit down at the Thanksgiving dinner table with your family and try to have a discussion. Uh, That's, (laughs) that's rough. My family's delightful by the way, but you know, it's just in general, that's a really rough thing to do, just differing opinions. But if you can talk about something you saw on Star Trek or that you watch Black Panther again, and it brought up some things that you want to talk about, it's an easy way to do it. Exactly. And I do want to talk about Black Panther and Chadwick and that emotional toll that we're still feeling the ramifications from. First, because, okay, the the topic of the show is superheroes, but you brought up a great point. We're, We're also kind of talking about science fiction and fantasy, too. And a lot of the books, a lot of the anthologies that you are part of, and you can definitely bring up some of them. I just mentioned a, a few of them. There's a lot. It's not, yeah, it, it, and it's not just superheroes. It is. It's Star Trek, and it's Star Wars, and it's Game of Thrones. It's Walking Dead, which is one of my all-time favorites. <laughs> That's the only it's, one I didn't do, but I did edit on it. So. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> but it's the fandom, right? And it's yeah. escaping to this other world, especially when we need it the most. I know I am currently watching Game of Thrones again. It's almost like my comfort because I know the story, I know the characters, and I feel like I'm just hanging out with friends. Do you feel like fandom as you know an overarching thing is a little bit of that too? It kind of gives us a community, right? It does. And you know, one of the things I think that's really important about about fictional characters is we have something called a parasocial relationship with them. Um, where very often um we can't handle certain things in our lives. And, you know, now with everything going on, there, there's any number of things to choose from, um, usually more than one at once. And we can watch a character go through something and feel like we have a real relationship with them. Um, they might be able to do things that are that we think are braver than, than what we could do ourselves. Um, and I think that, you know, this is why we also mourn characters when they die at the end of a book or a movie or something like that, because we feel close to them. We can relate to them. We can watch them go through things. We can see how they handle it. We can see how they don't handle it. Um, and and it really, it brings you closer to them. It's also different than um, an in-person relationship or an over the internet relationship because there's no feedback from them. So they really feel like a close friend, someone who's never going to say anything against you, somebody who's who's always going to do the right thing. And you can look up to that. And I, I think that's why it's so important. Oh, absolutely. And talking about superheroes and, and passing, Black Panther, I think, is just reverberate, re- reverberating right now throughout fandoms and the community. And I know when I heard about Chadwick, I, I was I was just in shock. And I think that's something too, when your real life superheroes have passed. And I know that you, why don't you talk about that? Because you were part of the Black Panther anthology too, and you've interviewed him. Want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. um, I got to interview him for Black Panther. um, And he was just so lovely, just so, just very gentle. He just had this very gentle energy. And he his work in Black Panther and all the other movies that he did, but particularly Black Panther for me because I'm a nerd. Um, it really spoke to me, and you know I'm a I'm a white girl, but I know what representation means. I know what it meant to me to see Wonder Woman on the big screen. I know what it means when you see yourself, and for ge- a generation of kids and for adults too, they got to see a black superhero, and that's as the lead in a film and not just one person in a group. It was the whole film. And it's so cool. It's so cool. And, you know, when we wrote Black Panther Psychology, um, one of the chapters that I did, because I thought, well, what, what, 
relevance do I have to this? So we talked about women in combat because mm-hmm. there are so many powerful women in that movie. Um, and that was that was a really important thing for me. I, I have not been in combat myself. I do have many swords in my house, but I have not actually <laughs> used them. Um, Good but, to know. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, they're not they're not really you really you couldn't even really open a letter with them, but they're no. cool. Um, but but I think Black Panther is just it was just such a powerful movie for so many people and also not just that but even just seeing the politics of a country and being able to talk about isolationism be able being able to talk about what happens if you have a place where you are outside of racism you know where this whole country is technologically advanced and wonderful and beautiful and has this such gorgeous traditions and and to be able to see that on the big screen was just so cool and and I don't know if you've seen all over Facebook but the memes of all these little kids with all their superhero figures having funerals for the king and saying Wakanda forever like that just and it's it's crazy that whole day the whole day I did the um the press junket for Black Panther you walk in and every actor said Wakanda forever and they did they did the arm pose and it was just it was just such an amazing experience oh i can only imagine and now you've touched on something that i do want to dig into because when we talk about women and especially how they're portrayed like wonder woman or in comics that's one thing and you had some experiences with gamergate that oh. i want to talk about First, though, I'd be remiss if we didn't also talk about Stanley because you worked with the legend. You did cocktails with Stanley. So really quick, tell us what that was like, because that was that that would be just like the most amazing thing, in my opinion. Oh, my gosh. I, I couldn't believe it when I was told about this possible hosting opportunity. They didn't tell me who it was with. And then they finally they said, this is going to be with Stan Lee. And I went, no. Nope. Hmm. And. He was so wonderful. The first day I walked in, I've told the story before, but he had um, he had a copy of my comic book and wanted me to sign it. He said, I know everything about you and you work very hard. I'm never getting over that for the rest of my life. That's it was incredible. And we'd shoot, you know, three, four five shows a day sometimes. And he and I would interview celebrities together. And between takes, he would tell me about how much he loved his wife. And he talked about her all the time, and it was really lovely. And he kept saying, I was post-divorce at the time, he kept saying, you will meet a wonderful young man, and if you don't, I'm going to find one for you. Luckily, <laughs> I did. But <laughs> but he was just so wonderful. And when I actually did Captain America versus Iron Man psychology, and um, when I did Daredevil psychology, when I contributed to them, he was willing to do the intro, but he said, I don't want to write it. You just interview me and turn it into an intro. So that's Uh, what I did. (laughs) Oh, I love that. I love that. And he he was such a creative genius, too. He he seems like one of those people that just and he didn't. He really kind of didn't stop (laughs) ever. Oh, oh, yeah. No, that man loved working. Um, And even when I could tell he was tired, even when, you know, we had been shooting for hours and hours and hours, if we'd shoot in a restaurant and they would close it off. But sometimes a waiter or a busboy would sneak in and Mr. Lee. Do you think we could just get an autograph? And he, his face would light up. He'd turn on public persona because he told me he knew what this meant to them. He said he didn't understand why, which is crazy. But he said, I, I do know that it makes people happy. So I can't show them less than my best. And he, he would just, I, I spent a lot of time with him backstage at conventions because I'd moderate a lot of his panels. And he would always be ready to talk to anyone, no matter how tired he was. And that I think that's pretty wonderful. Yeah, he he was a superhero in his own right, as he well really as great many superheroes. Now let's dig into that Gamergate issue because yeah. I, I I know this happened quite a while well quite a while ago. Do you mind setting the stage for people who might not be familiar with it or know exactly what was going on back then? Sure, sure. Um, there so there's a very complicated beginning to this, but what it ended up being was women getting harassed online who in the gaming industry, people who develop games and also anybody reporting on them, talking about them. Um, I remember I wrote a story where I talked about um, 
a study that said that there were almost as many female gamers as male gamers. Now I think it's, we've surpassed it. People got so. very, very angry at me. I mean, the things that I was called, the, the, one, the one word that we do not use when we talk about women, seven times a day average, I was called that. Um, I was, anytime I posted anything about gaming, I got death threats. People were saying that they should sexually assault me, that they should come to my house, that they were going to put out um, my address. And I had just moved into my boyfriend, my boyfriend's place and I wasn't on the lease yet. So luckily no one could find, but people just show up and they would find me places. And it was really scary. I actually considered leaving social media um, and I considered leaving the industry. I never thought writing about video games, something I have loved since Pac-Man, you can do the math. I am old enough to have played Pac-Man. And when it came out and it, it just blew my mind that this was a thing. Like when I was a kid, guys would always say to me, oh, I wish there were more girls that play video games. And now that there are, they're very, very mad that we're here. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's, that's the thing. So I like to game too, by the way. I remember, high five, I, high I, five. I, I, yep. I play <laughs> Pac-Man too. I get it. Love it. I still play Call of Duty. And oh, wow. It's a stress reliever for me. I'm like, okay, I just want to kill people today. And it's like, boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. And I can do that. Um, but I intentionally shy away from anything where I'm talking to anybody. Oh, absolutely. You know, 10, 15 years ago, I played Halo. And I would just get slammed all the time. And finally, I'm like, I'm not talking to y'all. I'm just yeah. turning off my mic. I'm, I'm not going to listen to you. But that's the thing. It, 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 if men want more women to play video games, then that barrier needs to go away. And I'm not saying all men, because I know that the men are right, going to be right. like, I I, mean, no, group. not all men. No, I get it. I get <laughs> it. It just takes one or two jerks to really throw, literally throw you off your game, which is what they're trying to do a lot yep. of times. Yep. And a, a lot of times women don't want to deal with it. Now, what you dealt with, the, this harassment, like, that that's something that exists too. And women just need to be very, very careful when they're online gaming. And when I say they're online gaming, because these are communities when we're on our Xbox, when we're, you know, on our PlayStation, these are online communities as well. And there's Twitch, for example, it's a whole social media network. And I'm kind of just explaining, I know you understand this, but just explaining it for people who might not be aware that gaming in and itself is a community and it can be threatening and dangerous to women sometimes. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've done stuff on camera for a long time, so I'm used to getting a lot of harassment. It just sort of goes with the territory if you do this sort of thing for a living, but that got dangerous that, that we got into threats then. And that was really frightening. You know, if somebody smiled at me as I was walking down the street, I was wondering, is this the person that's going to attack me? And I did a, a panel about Gamergate um, at LA Comic Con when it was still Kamikaze. And my boyfriend was in the back of the room and he's a very, very tall guy. And so um, there was a guy who was harassing us with a Q during the Q&A um, saying that our panel was all white. I was the only white person on the panel. So <laughs> just no one else was. <laughs> So I was like, no. And he's like, what? it's all men. And then I was like, no. And then he said later something about it being women. And I was like, okay, this, what? And he was fuddling around in his backpack. And we don't know what it was, but he started aggressively coming towards the front. And my boyfriend actually had to walk him out of the room. And they were even talking at that convention about like, what do we do if something happens? So we were a little concerned about the room and security. And, you know, just the, the lesson that I took from it was to be very careful about what personal information you put up, um, which is just a good thing in general. Um, you don't feed the trolls. I know that line's been around for a thousand years, but it, it really matters. Like if you, not that you can't sometimes make a difference with people, but for the most part, they want a response. And so if mm -hmm. you don't give it to them, they get bored. So I just stop feeding the trolls and I just politely, you know, if I do answer at all, I'll generally politely say, I'm just going to be blocking you. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great advice. And do you feel that the environment is getting better? Do you feel that the, some of those misogynistic attitudes are quelling a little bit? What do you feel like it's like now compared to what it was at the height of Gamergate? 
Well, I mean, I think in some ways it's gotten better because one thing that Gamergate did was shine a light on how many female gamers there are. And how easy, easy it is to find them on social media. We can, we can find each other. We can play in all, all female groups or a group that pledges no harassment, people of all genders and ages and all of that. I beta tested the first um, Xbox a thousand years ago. And one of the first things that I, I heard over the earphones from a little kid was, you guys aren't the type of people that are mean to little kids, are you? So it happens to everybody. Um, But I do think some of the attitudes are starting to change, but I think it's a very loud minority who, you know, gets angry that, say, the upcoming Assassin's Creed Valhalla, um, you can choose to be a male character or a female character. People get really mad about that. Like, well, just play as a male character if that's what you want to do. Cool. Good luck. Have fun. Like. So I do think it's getting better, but I do think part of that is because a lot of us online are being more cautious about it. And that extends even into some of the fandoms, too. We all know that there has been, you know, actors who have had lots of controversy for being in a certain role. Star Wars comes to mind for obvious reasons that there's just a lot of hate that happens out there within these fandoms. And it it just doesn't have to be that way. No, it doesn't. I remember when um, Rogue One came out, when the first trailer came out, I was running to a plane, but I posted about it. And the first comment I got back was, oh, my God, another female lead. And I was like, did you watch the trailer? There were two women in that entire trailer. What are you complaining about? So, but yeah, I think fandoms just get toxic. And I think people just want to get attention. So Mm -hmm. being a jerk gets you attention. That's true. That's true. And like you said, don't feed those trolls. Yep. Don't give it to them. All right. Right now, I want you to talk a little bit more because we bounced all over the place. So, <laughs> yes, you have all of these anthologies and you are so prolific in your writing and your work. Tell us a little bit more about the books that you are working on or t- t- tell us what you want to talk about, about you. OK, so um, I have been part of 11 of the 12 books in the Psych Geek series. So, you know, I've got the Star Wars psychology and Game of Thrones and Captain America versus Iron Man and Black Panther and Joker. And um, and those have been so much fun and I want to do more. And I just think they, they're a blast. But I've also done comics. Um, I have two stories in the um, Womanthology anthology, which was really cool. Right now I am working on a, a, a novel that's in historical fiction um, based in a time period that I, I particularly love. So I'm on draft two um, and I wrote a self-help book that I have not uh, put out yet, but I wrote it in six weeks. And it's sort of half memoir, half self-help book. <laughs> so it sort of crosses genres. So we'll, we'll see how that ends up getting marketed. Um, I'm also working on a body positivity book with my co-author, Dr. Janina Scarlett, who, has, uh, who started Superhero Therapy, um, which is, she's a psychologist and her, she works with people and talks about being a superhero in real life. So I'm really excited about that. And, um, I've just, I'm writing for a bunch of websites now and, um, getting a couple of, couple of other little projects together, but, but I love doing stuff like this. I, I just, I love talking about things that I love. Um, I even thought like if I had a dream project, it would be to write a book about Anne McCaffrey's work and her whole Dragon Riders of Pern series. Oh, that's a great idea. You should do that. You should I'd really love do to. that. I'd love to. I don't know. I mean, I, I got to, um, she, she was the author that got me into sci-fi and fantasy. Mm-hmm. So I met, I never got to meet her with all the people that I've interviewed in my career. I never got to meet her. Um, and I did get to meet her son at Comic-Con uh, Todd McCaffrey and I read his stuff too. And it was just, it was really cool to be able to talk about her. So I know he already has a, I believe he has a book about her too, but, um, and that was his mom. So I feel like he could, he's probably a better authority, but someday (laughs) maybe I will write something about that because I would really love to. That's, that's a great idea. Okay. Since you brought it up, I'm going to ask you all of the celebrities, all of the people that you've ever talked to, who you've ever interviewed, who was, uh, I don't want to say your favorite because that's a little bit trite, but who who do you feel was the most interesting or caught you most off guard or just, you know, has a fabulous, you have a fabulous story about? Oh, wow. Um, Helen Mirren was one of my favorites. Oh. Oh. Um, 
just I I don't usually get starstruck because mm-hmm. I've been doing this for so long, and you know, particularly at a, a convention, sometimes I'll interview 60, 70 people. Um, sometimes more than that. I've done more than that. I've done. I interviewed one time. I interviewed I think thirty five people in one day. So wow. <laughs> you wouldn't think I'd be starstruck, but every once in a while there's somebody, and Helen Mirren is definitely one of the ones. And just talking to her was incredible. And I, I, I left that room not remembering what I said to her. So this is why you have to do like a lot of preparation and know your questions before you go in. So if that does happen, then you, you can still speak. And when I listened to the interview later, I was like, oh, okay, I, I said things. They can make sense. <laughs> it's fine. Um, and then I got Emma Thompson. I was interviewing her for Nanny McPhee. Mm. And she, she, after I finished the interview, I said, just, you know, I'm so excited for my niece to watch this movie. She's going to love it so much. And she's like, can I hug you? That, oh. that, and, and yes, the answer to that is always yes. Emma Thompson, you can <laughs> always hug me. That's fine. <laughs> so that was a, that was a shock. I also remember coming out of an interview um, with John Favreau ye- before Iron Man came out. Mm-hmm. And I knew about Iron Man, but I guess a lot of people weren't talking about it yet. And I asked him about it and then he followed me out of the room and he said, did you, how'd you know about Iron Man? I'm like, Man, I read comics. I love comics. It's like, that's really surprising. Because back then, you know, I got a lot of, you don't look like you like comics. Or you don't <laughs> look like you play video games. I'm like, what? Re- okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so um, so those were really big ones. Um, I did have Russell Brand one time sing me a song about cats having sex that he just improved on the spot. Of course you did. <laughs> I, it, was, it was very entertaining. I enjoyed it very much. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, I, I, I imagine him as quite a character to talk to. He is very fun to interview. I met his mom. I was interviewing him in London, of all places, for um, Get Him to the Greek. And he, I was the last interview of the day, and his mom was there, so he introduced me to his mom. <laughs> she was also delightful. Oh, that's lovely. That's lovely. <laughs> so, all yeah, right. they're weird ones. Yeah, yeah. Well, and how can people find you, find your website, follow you on social media, all that kind of stuff? Okay, cool. So my website is jennabush.net, and it's B-U-S-C-H, like the beer, not the president. I get a lot, despite the fact that all of my social media clearly states I am not the former president's daughter. My dad is online, but he he was never the president of the country. So, <laughs> um, But it's jennabush.net. Um, my social media, Instagram and Twitter are at Jenna Bush and Jenna Bush 13 or Jenna Bush public page are, um, my two Facebook pages and I check both of them. So I'm, I'm very happy to say hi. And you can also check out, I have a, um, a podcast. It's a comedy history podcast called hysterical H I S T E R I C A L. But, um, I do this with Anastasia Washington and that's been a blast. So that's hysterical pod everywhere. Oh, I love that. Yes. And tell Anastasia I said hi. I That's will. actually how we met. It is. <laughs> it is. Through her. <laughs> she is very awesome and has a new kitten. So. Oh, lovely, yes. lovely. I, yeah, I, I see her on social media all the time, but please tell her I said hi. And thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, especially Jenna. You yourself are a superhero in thank your own you. right. Thank you for everything you do to inspire everybody with your writing and your words and everything that you do. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you for having me. You bet. You bet. And thank you everybody for being here as well. This has been the books that make you show. And once again, I am your host, Desiree Duffy, and you can find out more about us on our website. That is books that make you.com. We are also on social media, Facebook, and Instagram, of course. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You might be watching us there right now. Hit that little subscribe button. Until next time, my friends, please enjoy all of the books that make you exactly who you are. The executive producer for Books That Make You is Desiree Duffy. Produced and sound mastered by Phil Jean Grande. Engineering by Dave Nabox. Social media and promotion by Bree Sweeter. For more, visit booksthatmakeyou.com.